Thank you so much uh, and welcome to all of you today. I have to say I'm, I'm really truly delighted to have our guest lecturer today, Ambassador Havas, who I've had the privilege of knowing for a number of years. Again, here we have someone who brings incredible rich experience in diplomacy, international law. He is currently ambassador um, of the Republic of Indonesia to the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, he was Vice Minister of Maritime Sovereignty, Coordinating Minister for Maritime Affairs. He was Ambassador to Belgium, Director General for Law and International Treaties. Um, and I will go on, but I want him to speak, so I'll, I won't uh, go through his entire curriculum video because it's impossible. But also, he is someone who has a tremendous experience in negotiations. He has negotiated many bilateral and regional negotiations, including one of the most complex uh, maritime del delimitation boundaries, and also for criminal matters. He's been extremely active in, in the very important matter of IAU fishing. Um, so I'm, I could go on and say that he's highly sought after as a speaker, and the center is very fortunate to have him, not only as a friend and supporter of the center, but a member of the international uh, advisory panel. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to invite him to speak on a topic of great importance. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Nilu. And also thank you, colleague from uh, the CIL for inviting me as the guest speaker this morning here in Germany and this afternoon in um, Asia or probably in somewhere else uh, in parts of the world. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, share actually uh, an issue that just came up, I think, recently, maybe the last uh, 10 years or so, or even 15 years or so, that has not actually caught up with the international attentions. Uh, it came up with international attentions maybe around 2014, 15. Uh, it's already been discussed at the uh, different uh, forum, at the ILC, at the ILA, and there's some writings already came up on the rising of uh, sea level in relations to maritime zones uh, and maritime entitlement. And uh, we have seen uh, real difficult cases in the Pacific countries where they are looking at the possibility of their whole country disappears because of the rising sea level. So this is actually a very interesting uh, issue and matters. Uh, at the end of my presentations, I will only offer you ideas. I could not offer you solutions. And maybe uh, based on these uh, discussions, we can also have uh, uh, some ideas. Maybe you could inspire ideas from uh, many of you of this uh, Shail Academy. We know uh, Professor Oral Nilu and um, Patricia, Professor Tellis from Portugal. They're both uh, very active on this particular issue uh, in the ILC. And uh, they have also been uh, working on this matter as well. So this is, I think, is a very good uh, platform for us to have a discussion on this uh, matter. I have a, a, a PowerPoint, um, not uh, many words, just many pictures. I will share with you and I hope we can have a nice discussion after that. So here we go. So what you see here is a, a aerial picture of one village in the northern part of Jaffa from Indonesia. This uh, house has been abandoned. Uh, the owner of the house left uh, together with 3,500 uh, member of the village has been relocated. And uh, this uh, happened in 2015. And this is uh, happening in the northern part of uh, Java Island. It is not related to our maritime uh, claims or maritime zone because uh, it faces Jaffa Sea. But if this happens in the area where our coastline face uh, neighboring countries or Indian Ocean, 
then there is a big questions on the, what are we going to do with the rising sea level, which also mean uh, inward uh, movement of a baseline. And you can also imagine from this picture, the countries in the Pacific, small countries in the Pacific that might be totally eradicated uh, because of the rising of uh, sea level. Uh, this is the uh, assessment from the IPCC uh, on the rising of sea level. If you look on the year uh, 1700, 1800, 1900, the rising, it's more or less uh, stable. It goes up, but it's much more stable. But if you look at uh, 2100, then the rising uh, came up with different scenario. The worst scenario is 1.2 meters. The moderate scenario is one meter. The possible scenario is uh, 0.8 or around 82 centimeters. So this is a uh, different type of scenarios uh, that IPCC was actually doing and modeling uh, in our parts of uh, the world. The uh, rising of the global sea, uh, global mean sea level, of course, is increasing continuously. Now, we have no idea the impact of COVID-19 uh, to the rising of sea level because uh, we have seen a reduction of industrial activity, airline activities, uh, sea activities that, that may reduce the number of the emission and probably uh, have some impact, but uh, you know we don't know yet, or maybe it just make a small dent. But the fact of the matter, as the first picture that I given to you, uh, the rising sea level already uh, existed. This is uh, the source of the rising of sea level. You have uh, the thermal expansion. You have the melting of glaciers and ice sheets from Greenland, from Antarctica. And uh, it's very interesting that the whole ice in Greenland can hold uh, seven meters rising of sea level. And Antarctica is whopping 58 uh, meters. So if they are to melt, then uh, probably uh, we will have to move uh, to uh, Himalaya or to highest mountain. Uh, and then the, it will create another uh, disasters in, in our planet. Uh, this is the uh, sea level change in many different cities in the world. These are all data that I took from the IPCC, so you can also consult with that uh, in, the, in the future. So from New York, Venice, uh, Coxhaven here in Germany, Alexandria, Shanghai, and Fiji, Buenos Aires, Guam, Zanzibar, Tahiti, Panama, and Sydney all shows uh that the sea level is already uh, risen you have uh observed the uh, rising sea level it means already uh, uh taking place you have the model estimates and then you have the model estimates corrected for the bias so from all these uh, different uh informations we are looking at the fact that the rising of sea level it's happening uh, already uh, this is an uh, uh, additional picture from the northern part of uh, Jaffa, specifically in the northern part of central Jaffa, where the, the rising of sea level went up uh, quite, quite uh, so strongly. The water uh, is 1.2 meters now going inside. So this are used to be villages and mangrove. And now it's just mangrove. And there are some houses there, but they are already abandoned. Uh, this is um, some houses that uh, they are abandoning. They are trying to have some nature-based solutions by planting mangrove in the front yard, in the backyard. But uh, it seems that uh, it's not it's not it's not going uh, as they would like to. And IPCC also uh, provided an analysis that. If uh, we have mangrove, for instance, uh, it may not necessarily be able to stop 
the rising of sea level. Sea level will go up, mangrove will still be there, uh, but uh, the houses, the community, the livelihood around the coastal area will be wiped out. This is uh, near Jakarta, okay, uh, and um, this is near Jakarta as well. So even near this, the the capital of uh, Indonesia, we already have uh, you know sea level rise. This is a mosque in the village in the north of uh, Jakarta, and uh, it's been abandoned. Uh, there are some villages already abandoned in this area. So this is the phenomenon that we have in the northern part of Java, in the Java Sea. We do not have yet this in the Indian Oceans, but um, we have to be prepared, especially countries uh, in the Indian Oceans uh, rim, whether uh, India or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka, small country in East Africa, they need to look at this uh, phenomenon very, very carefully. So, uh, the impacts are uh, very widespread. Uh, this again is the analysis from the IPCC on uh, the impact of the rising sea level. You can see they have impact on the issue of uh, loss of land. We have seen that in Indonesia uh, and probably in other country as well. People need to be relocated. They have some culture shock with the new place. They have problem adjusting because then they used to be living in the coast, so they don't live in the coast anymore. Um, livelihood needs to be adjusted. Um, government needs to take care of uh, the place where they live. So there are so many uh, different aspects. Legal aspect, for instance, uh, the land title. What about the land title of the previous uh, land? Are they when they are submerged? You know what is the, the status of that? So uh, it's a lot of things that uh, we need to do as a central government and local government in Indonesia specifically on this matter. Now, uh, what are the impacts on the maritime zone and boundaries in the terms of international law perspective? Let's look at the uh, articles on the UNCLOS that specifically uh, rules on the breadth of uh, maritime zones. We have the Territorial Sea uh, rules in Article 3. We have uh, contiguous zone in the Article 32.2. We have Article 57 on EEZ and Article 76 on continental shelves. All of those maritime zones, uh, Territorial Sea, contiguous zone, EEZ and continental shelf, they all are measured from baselines. And uh, the important aspect is that uh, the baselines that they are being used as a basis to measure this different maritime zone, uh, they are, according to the UNCLOS, has to be located in the low water line of the coast. So low water line means the lowest water line uh, when the seas are, 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 are receding, okay? Because there are area, and there are some area, for instance, in Indonesia, uh, maybe in other countries, I'm sure they have as well, where the low water line and the highest water line can have a difference between 300 and 600 meters. There are certain oceans uh, around Indonesia that behaves like that, uh, especially in the area of uh, Sulawesi Sea, where one island where the low water line goes all the way down 600 meters. And then when the highest tide, it goes back to somewhere 600 meters. So it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, set of situation. We call them the ambulatory baseline. And uh, this is the place where you uh, calculate the maritime zone. You can also have a straight baseline. But of course, straight baseline uh, are connecting different points. But if all those points are located in the baseline that are moving inward, then your straight baseline will also move uh, inward as well. That also goes the same thing to countries like Indonesia, uh, the Philippines or Fiji, uh, country that has the uh, status of archipelagic state. So we can draw a straight archipelagic baseline. 
joining the outermost points of outermost islands and on drying reefs or any other feature. But that, of course, uh, has to be uh, a straight baseline that link to points on the normal baseline. It's, it's, it's how it's done. It's, it's how it is. Now, there is also one important aspect uh, in the archipelagic baseline rules. A country cannot claim to be archipelagic if the ratio of the area of land and water is not in the context of one to one and nine to one. Uh, I would say uh, this mathematical approach is very interesting because if you look at the uh, uh, rules and stipulations on archipelagic state, they have geographic and mathematical uh, uh, rules as well. Others are saying low water line along the coast and uh, straight base line joining appropriate points. But for us, archipelagic states, uh, there is a mathematical constraint. Therefore, it is, it is very, very uh, rigid. So this is the maritime zones. Of course, you've seen this uh, uh, chart, this picture uh, in, in many different settings. So if you look at the baseline there, uh, 12 nautical mile territorial sea, and then another 12, which is 24 from baselines, it's a contiguous zone. And uh, you see all the maritime zones are calculated from uh, baseline. So if the baseline moves back or inward because of the rising sea level, then everything may move back. So that is the, the logic uh, that, that it's uh, being seen now. Now, um, as I mentioned before, the, this will, will create a movement of inward, the sea level rise, and uh, it also mean that the uh, straight uh, archipelagic baseline or normal baseline will also be moving inward. For uh, archipelagic uh, countries, uh, I'll give you uh, a picture here. So imagine if one of the islands or archipelagic country is gone completely, then the land and water ratio may not be one to one and nine to one. Then that country could become just an island state, not an archipelagic state. Then uh, they, they would be like UK or Japan, uh, archipelagos, but not archipelagic. So this is a very interesting uh, impact as well, which is uh, uh, quite uh, traumatic uh, for uh, archipelagic states, which they may still have some islands uh, for their populations, but if some islands critical in the baselines are, are submerged, then they may have to look in the situation where they are not anymore uh, archipelagic uh, state. Now, uh, the questions for treaties that has been signed, say for instance, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, maritime boundaries on continental shelf, Indonesia, India, uh, Continental Shelf Treaty, Indonesia, Thailand, Continental Shelf uh, Treaty or Indonesia, Singapore, um, territorial waters that I have the privilege to negotiate uh, from 2004 to 2009, uh, the law to treaty applies. So the boundary is uh, still uh, exists and it is not going to be changed. It will be very interesting uh, in different countries like in the Pacific, where they have the maritime boundaries, they have the outer boundaries, but they don't have the land anymore. So this is another very interesting legal issue that we have to look at it. Um, so what are the state responses? Um, mostly uh, the countries in the Pacific, they have taken steps because they are very much impacted on this uh, particular uh, issue. But the rest, they are either you know, unaware or they don't have a response uh, they concluded. I mean, even for us, uh, where we have many experts on law of the sea, where we have uh, area that is being impacted, 
uh, Indonesia itself, we still uh, on the studies level. We have uh, done many meetings. We are looking at different state practices. We are looking at um, analysis of our own coastline. So we still not yet uh, have a solid policy as such. We have some drafts internally moving around but uh, not uh, so much as what uh, these different countries that uh, have taken steps. We have the Polynesian states and territories. We have Pacific countries, party to Nauru agreement. We have the PIF, Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, and we have individual country Marshall Islands uh, already taken steps. Um, the Polynesian states and territories uh, in 2015, there are seven countries. They made a um, declarations that they signed the declaration Tabu Tabu Atea on climate change. Um, they they made this statement uh, in the preparation of Paris Agreement at that time. Uh, I was privileged to be in the negotiations in Paris and uh, the negotiation of climate change other that as well. And um, they basically said that the member states of UNFCC must acknowledge the importance of uh, the EEZ, the resources of the EEZ of the Polynesian island states. And um, they are establishing uh, permanent baselines without taking into account sea level rise. So they're basically saying that uh, this is our permanent baseline. This is how we is at. And um, if the sea level rise uh, goes up and we are to disappear, then those remains the same. So in a sense, freeze the baseline and also freeze the outer limit of uh, the EEZ as well. And uh, Pacific countries, parties of Nauru agreement, uh, they have uh, Micronesia, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Palau, uh, PNG, uh, Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu. They uh, signed an agreement uh, also having the same uh, idea of the previous declaration, which is to define a permanent baseline, a baseline that it, remain in perpetuity irrespective of the impacts of sea level rise. Okay, so these are another state practices uh, in the Pacific uh, there in 2018. Um, the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, uh, they also issued a, a document, uh, a statement called the PIF Strategy Document Framework for the Pacific Ocean Scape very interesting terminology. Uh, we have landscape on terrestrial, and yet they have uh, the Pacific Ocean scape. And uh, in the Pacific Ocean scape, they were talking about uh, the Pacific Island countries and territories need to delineate their maritime zones and then uh, submit it to the UN and create what they call the fixed baseline and maritime boundary. So again, it's a fixed baseline and a fixed outer baseline. So this is, uh, again, a state practice coming from uh, our brothers and sisters in the Pacific. Um, individual states, uh, they have done so. Marshall Island, Kiribati, and Tuvalu, they have new legislations. Uh, you can consult this uh, at uh, Dualos website. They already submit that. And of course, you can also look at uh, different sites in the internet. They're basically saying that the baseline is not any more low tide, but it's now fixed geographic coordinates. So they just uh, give a fixed ge geographic coordinates and this is our baseline, this is our maritime zone. And uh, this comes in, in permanent and perpetuity. Um, through the UN system, as I mentioned uh, before, the ILC, as a study group and is co-chaired on rotation basis. And we have our two distinguished um, personalities in our discussion today, Patricia and Nilu. Uh, they are 
very well aware on this uh, matter. They are really well first on this issue. And uh, their works under the ILC is very much, uh, you know, uh, followed and seen by member states. And uh, as a member state, Indonesia is uh, very much looking at the result of their works uh, later on. And at, I think at this, at this current state, uh, the ILC uh, is looking at state practices on the different aspects, state practices on baseline, Ajibajik baseline, closing lines, low tide elevations, uh, delimitation of maritime boundaries, also any other issue that might be relevant to the subject of the rising uh, sea level. And um, we have uh, also through legal opinions, already some documents uh, came out from the ILA, International Law Associations. Um, they had a very interesting document came up from the Sydney conference in 2018. And they basically, uh, I would say, restate what the state practice in the Pacific. So basically, the idea is to freeze, uh, maintain the baselines. And uh, they are using uh, charts to de define that, or they maintain the existing divine outer limits. This is the idea that they propose at this stage. There are, of course, pros and cons of each and different points, A and B. Uh, it's very interesting to follow the discussions uh, on this particular issue. Uh, I happen to be a member of ILA German chapter. We are going to have a meeting uh, at the end of this month. So I want to hear also whether my colleague from, from Germany have something to say on this particular matter. So this is all ongoing works. So um, this is basically the summary that uh, we see around uh, on the current state practice and legal thinking. Uh, the first one is to freeze the baseline. And uh, for a dissipating states, the maritime rights remain, although they have no land whatsoever. So deterritorialize. So for non-dissipating state, but suffering from inward coastal movement, maritime rights as before, they remain because the baseline is fixed and replaced with uh, geographic uh, coordinates. And uh, another thinking would be to freeze the outer limits of the maritime claim. So for disappearing states, maritime rights remain, although they have no land whatsoever. And for non-disappearing states, uh, but suffering from inward coastal movement, the maritime rights remain as before. Now, uh, both thinking, in my opinion, uh, I humbly submit, it produce one outcome. It will create, especially for disappearing states, a circle of sovereignty and sovereign rights in waters. So it's like not really a bubble, but you know, the imagine the Pacific. If uh, God forbid all those islands are submerged, then they follow this uh, position. Then you have a circles of sovereignty and sovereign rights. So then it's a big legal issue whether you have a sovereignty as such because the principle of uh, law of the sea is land dominates sea. So without land, can you have sovereignty? Maybe sovereign rights? I, I have no idea. Uh, this is again uh, something that uh, is developing uh, uh, currently. Now, um, I'm trying to look myself uh, on the Convention Law of the Sea. Okay, this is points that I took from the preamble of uh, UNCLOS. And uh, if you look very carefully uh, from the history of the negotiations, uh, you see that basically UNCLOS is a balance of interest of all states. And UNCLOS 1982 is very interesting because I would say, I would argue, this is probably the first international convention where countries from developing world uh, actually sit on the table with uh, the Western world. You know, uh, if you look at the conventions before uh, India, Indonesia, 
uh, Malaysia, Singapore got independence in the 40s, in the 50s, you know, all the international law are made by the Western powers, okay? Um, even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they signed in 1945, which is actually, for me personally, is a bit interesting because the Dutch as colonizers still colonize us and they signed Bill of Rights. I mean, <laughs> this is funny, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's how it was, okay? So um, this is probably the first convention where we from developing countries were actually sitting together with uh, uh, the colonizers, our former colonizers at the time. And thus and therefore, it's a, it's a place where the interests of the newly, newly, newly independent countries has to be taken uh, into account. So uh, even if you look uh, very carefully in the point three, the interest of landlock. So a country that is not, they don't have sea at all. It's something that has not been thought about uh, before uh, the negotiation in the 60s. Or maybe they have some idea, but there is no such thing like a landlock uh, being taken into account uh, uh, in this uh, particular aspect of uh, constitutions of uh, the ocean. So basically, the interests of all states are being taken care of. So specifically, landlock. So landlock is defined as a state which has no seacoast, right? And landlock has certain sets of rights uh, under the conventions. Uh, Article 125, for instance, they have right to access to and from the sea and freedom of transit. Um, they have... Uh, uh, they have rights of innocent passage. Uh, they have uh, rights on the EEZ, and they have even rights on the uh, on the uh, the areas. Uh, so it's it's the high seas, of course. So we are looking at the set of rights for a landlord. So a country with no coastline, a country with no sea. Uh, they are given certain rights by the Convention of Law of the Sea. So what about countries that used to have seas? So this is something that we have not thought about. I mean, if a country that has no coast is being taken care of, so a country that used to have sea, I think it should be taken care of. You know, then the question is how? Well, that, that would be lawyer and staff would argue in the UN. So this is this is the food of thought. So well, UNCLOS is not only a codification of existing customary international law, but also encapsulation of new novel ocean matters. Uh, landlocked states, for instance, archipelagic principles, it was fought by archipelagic states only, uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, Fiji, um, many country archipelagic states in the Caribbean, in the um, different parts of the world. EEZ was uh, basically a, a novel concept, extended continental shelf, the area, it's all, it's all new stuff, okay? That was not there, and it was introduced into the negotiations. Now, rising of sea level uh, is not an issue at the negotiations. In the first chart that I uh, shown you early on, we have uh, more or less um, rising sea level very slowly, 1700, 1800, 1900, early 2000. So it's not yet in the mind of uh, global communities, unlike today. So uh, thus, uh, for disappearing states, a regime that akin to landlocked states, such as landlocked state, I mean, this is my own word, so not many, many countries will like it, but this is just the idea. Landlocked states could also be uh, considered. Uh, I don't know what uh, Nilu and Patricia thought about this, but uh, you know this is uh, just thinking that if a, a, a landlocked state is being taken care of, so landlocked states should also be somehow uh, be taken care of in that in that in that uh, matter. Now, for non-disappearing states, I have a little bit of a problem uh, to be frank with uh, freezing the baselines because. Even today, we have a practice of excessive baselines. Even today, we have a practice of uh, reclamations, 
uh, by certain states. Uh, we have these particular challenges still. So I'm afraid that freezing baselines for for non-disappearing states uh, might somehow embolden uh, some excessive baseline practice until those practices are being handled very uh, you know clearly. Then the, uh, I think I could propose only probably the use of Article 11. So if you delimit your um, if you if you look at your lower sea lines, low sea level means now you have the data now. So you, you put that uh, on the map, you put it on the chart. And then if somehow your course recedes, you can use Article 11. So you can put some uh, constructions, for instance, man-made constructions on this uh, particular ge geographic coordinate and link that uh, to the course. Maybe that. So. We are doing now uh, adaptation of nature-based solutions, Indonesia itself, we are doing that. Uh, I've spoken with my colleague on the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry that we should also do man-made adaptation strategy, not just nature-based solution uh, strategy, because we have this uh, uh, political and legal issue that came up uh, very strongly in relation to the rising sea level. So last part, this is my drawing. Um, about rising sea level and sovereignty, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's a bit silly drawing, but uh, I think it encapsulates uh, all the things that I mentioned before. Um, so you see all this uh, rising sea level, you see someone is uh, used to be laying on a beach and then they're running away. And then you have the legal implication, possible response, either you flight or you fight. Uh, and then you have legal aspect and you have all this different uh, stuff that uh, comes out of there. So it's just basically a, a very simple one page that uh, would explain all this uh, aspect that I've mentioned to you. So thank you very much uh, for the attentions and uh, you know I hope we have a nice chat after this. Nilo. Yeah, great, fantastic uh, ambassador. Absolutely uh, fantastic presentation. You started off with those striking images uh, from Indonesia of what is real time sea level rise. Um, and this is happening right now and people really are suffering actually. Um, so, but you gave us a wonderful overview of the science, the legal issues, and you even introduced some novel concepts such as land lost state. So I think this is something we'll have to reflect on. Uh, I have to admit when you were referring to landlock, I was going, hmm, landlock state so, <laughs> and sea level rise. And then I understood it. Uh, so that's wonderful. And the point about um, fixed baselines, I think it's something to talk about um, the concerns that you raise. And, and I, I know that the ILA and the ILC um, are those looking at it, of course, those existing maritime boundaries that are in compliance with international law. But the best part, of course, is seeing your artwork. And, um, and I think hopefully maybe one day we'll see that framed. So thank you so much. It was really a fantastic presentation on an issue that is truly a pressing concern for the international community and international law. Now, I know we have some questions here. And um, one is from Bettina Rayora from Philippines. And um, after saying greetings, the question is, do the domestic legislation fixing baselines to geographical points have any binding effect under international law? So it's a very specific question. Yeah, it's um, no, but uh, you create a state practice and uh, it's uh, if you have enough countries doing that and uh, if the ILC then uh, take it up and then the, the state parties discuss about it, uh, then it might impact uh, in the long run. I think the questions is like uh, what the Philippines did or Indonesia did in the 40s and the 50s where we both have our own domestic legislation claiming ourselves to be archipelagic state. Was that binding? No, no, they didn't bind. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at the 
um, uh, classified documents, uh, Bettina, uh, all the major powers were basically unhappy with the claim of Philippines and Indonesia of the, of, of the archipelagic uh, waters. So uh, there were a lot of uh, demars, there was a lot of protests. They were basically saying that these countries, Indonesia and the Philippines could not do that. But then Fiji came up and the country in, the, in, in, in uh, Latin America came up, in Africa came up, in the movement of the Asian Africa came up, and then it all uh, goes to the discussions in Geneva. Then you have the archipelagic principle. So I think it's uh, akin to that. It's like uh, when someone claim uh, territorial waters 200 nautical miles, for instance, and then others say 16 and 12 and 8 and whatnot. So then finally the discussion goes through the negotiations and then you have the 12 nautical miles. So now the answer, of course, not. But, uh, you know, if, we, this, if this fixing of boundaries, outer boundary and fixing of baselines come from a group of countries that might be disappeared, then I think we we need to have some sympathy on that, you know. Maybe they need to have some special treatment on their case by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one issue, and you raised the most active states, of course, and state practice is key right now. I don't know if you would agree, but basically, the Law of the Sea Convention um, doesn't really provide clear, direct answers to the issue of sea level rise. Um, so state practice is going to be key in filling those gaps and addressing these issues. And as you pointed out, the, the active states have been primarily from the Pacific, the Pacific Island states. And the region, this region, um, Indonesia, the, the Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean, um, you, you noted that they, they seem to be still developing. Um, how are we going to um, advance this issue? Um, will it be regionally or through the multilateral process? What's the role of the Law of the Sea Convention? I think, how do you see the possibility of us um, addressing this? And I think, you know, time is of the essence. Um, so if I could just pose that question to you while I allow the participants to, to um, submit their questions. And may I say, too, we have uh, Professor Bob Beckman here and Tara, so maybe they would like to pipe in as well. Mm. Yeah, I think the question is how we address this issue at the global level. Uh, I don't think we should do it at regional level, Nilu, because this is not a regional issue. This is a global issue. Um, I have seen the rising of sea level cases in Denmark. There are a couple of villages that have been removed uh, and they relocate the people. And uh, there are some reports that those uh, fishermen who south were, were um, uh, flooded and they moved to inland, um, some of them, they actually committed suicide because they cannot live in the city. I mean, this is just Denmark. This is not Indonesia or India or a big country where where we have uh, such a big uh, land and uh, you know we have different alternatives and this is a, a small one. Now, uh, it should be at the global level and that's why the role of the uh, ILA and ILC will be very important. And also uh, the regional countries, I would say, uh, need to uh, bring this up at the state parties of the consent of the sea. I know state parties, I was the president once, uh, we don't do substantive discussions, but but this is exceptional. You know, this uh, at least has to go into the other matters. Uh, countries need to start uh, coming up and uh, discuss about it. I mean, look at the BBNJ. BBNJ, it's, uh, you know, uh, it was not there and it was discussed uh, separately, but it's linked to uh, UNCLOS. It's not necessarily state party, so the UNCLOS is a member of UNGA. Uh, an, ex an exercise like this, Nilo, will be something that we need. So uh, the GA level, you need to have some discussion already going on. Uh, because if, if we want to find a forum, UNGA is the only one. Because look at the Paris Agreement. A Paris Agreement has only one word, ocean. I was in Paris when they were frantically trying to uh, conclude the agreement. 
and they did not put the ocean in the operative paragraph. Uh, you were there, Nilu. You were the one who pushed that, and and, and yeah, in some other countries, and um, we see that the reluctance. So Paris Agreement is basically terrestrial, while the Earth seventy three percent is our ocean. So it's a uh, it's weird, you know, as international law of the sea, we're not very happy. Remember, remember Paris, Nilo. Uh, the ocean I remember conference, it well. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the ocean uh, conference of the ocean people, we were not even allowed, you know, to be near the negotiation. And we are government, so it's, it's, it's very strange. And uh, uh, it's now it's better. The UNFCC is taking into account ocean discussion, even what they call the blue cop, supposedly in, in Glasgow. But in terms of decision making in relations to uh, baselines, then UNGA will be the place. Uh, and this is not a regional issue, this is a global issue. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I remember Paris very well. I was you know, part of the negotiation team for Turkey. And I have to say it was one of my uh, contributions was to push for the ocean uh, during the negotiations. And I was quite surprised at the pushback that came from it. Uh, but that is changing. And that's a whole other issue, but I, I, I can go on and we, we'll, we'll continue this discussion, but we have some questions. And first, I have a live question from Robert, and we encourage live questions. So, Robert, please uh, show yourself and, and ask your question to Ambassador Havas. Thank you. I, I certainly will. So um, this is probably a silly question. Um, so please feel free to tell me how silly it is, but I'd like to ask it anyway. So as I'm listening, um, and, and I'm, I'm very interested in what you're talking about in terms of, of um, the uh, low water line uh, and how you measure the territorial sea, I was just looking at the, at the, um, um, uh, the English Convention here where um, it's talking about the, the um, outer limit of the territorial sea. It says that in Article 5, Except where otherwise provided in this convention, the normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the low water line along the coast as marked on large scale charts officially recognized by the coastal state. So here's my silly question. It sounds to me as if there might be an argument that um, at the time that um, the, the convention was signed or at the time at which it became customary international law, at some relevant point in time, we might see uh, the action of the state recognizing officially um, it's um, baseline, that that might be the time that there's a snapshot taken already under the convention so that we are not continually every day remeasuring, but rather once and for all, the breadth of the territorial sea was set up to 12 nautical miles done. It was from a baseline that was set at that time and that that decision is made as a, just already. Um, is there any currency to that? Am I foolish for thinking that might be an argument? Thank you. Uh, uh, Robert, I think for for uh, disappearing states, that is just uh, that's the, the 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 most difficult part is that it and the the articles on baseline does not really matter anymore because when you have no line whatsoever, right? So this the impact would be for disappearing states and non disappearing states. I think uh, uh, if I look uh, if I remember very if I remember correctly. Uh, there are some countries that has ambulatory baseline, so the, the behavior of the coastlines are up and down, like uh, some parts of Indonesia, 600 meters in, 600 meters out. So these are the top of the thing they're looking at, but they're not looking at a permanent lead, you know, uh, uh, going up and up and up and up and do it, recede all the time, recede all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a matter of fact, looking at that, it means you have to, you have to actually uh, fit uh, continuously with the conditions of the ocean itself. Uh, we are actually one of the country uh, who keep looking at our baselines. Um, we are keep looking at our uh, normal baseline because although we are archipelagic state, we base ourselves on the points uh, on, on, on the baseline itself. So when the baselines uh, or the sea is going uh, inward or going uh, uh, in different directions, then we have to measure that. So we are actually now doing that uh, in Indonesia. We are probably going to revise our baseline uh, in next year. We'll probably have a, some announcement on that. Uh, and we will probably hopefully have some positions on, on this rising uh, sea level. 
Yeah. Right. Thank you, and, and Robert, uh, not a silly question at all, a very thoughtful one. Um, I have here a question <coughs> from Marcus Saw. <huh? coughs> Will UNCLOS need to be amended to take into account the rising sea levels? Otherwise, there will be confusion if we no longer use the baselines as defined in UNCLOS to measure the different maritime zones. Um, amendment of UNCLOS is very scary exercise. <laughs> <laughs> because some countries would want to include, uh, okay, the rising sea level, but others want to remove archipelagic principles. <laughs> others want to create uh, projections of 200 nautical miles from uh, the man-made infrastructure that just recently made. They probably have come up with a new uh, historic whatever, so no, we don't want to do that. You know, uh, it's, it's, uh, I would say, uh, not revision of the convention itself, but an exercise like BBNJ, uh, you know, that, uh, that hopefully can, can address that thing. It's, it's very difficult questions. Uh, I think everybody is scratching their heads on the best way to approach this, but the fact of the matter is we had this problem. And we need to address that. And uh, we don't want to revise the Convention of Law of the Sea because then it opens up uh, all yeah. different of arguments. Uh, and it is, it's a convention that we negotiated for uh, over 20 years or so. Imagine if you amend that uh, 20 years, even from the date of the amendment, this country may not be there anymore. So what we need is a, is a practical quick uh, solutions uh, for, especially for the disappearing, disappearing states. Now, um, I forget to dwell on the area, okay? The area is a, is a seabed that is designed, and de sorry, is designated by the International Seabed Authority. It is, it is not decided from any particular baseline, Nilo. So it means, that in the seabed of our planet, there is possibility of some area which may not necessarily be based on the projections of land. So um, based on the idea that landlocked states are taken care of their rights and landlocked states should be, and the fact that we have already uh, practice uh, where we uh, designated an area uh, at our ocean without coming from particular baseline. So a circle of sovereign rights, maybe, of the waters and the seabed could be or maybe, uh, you know, a solution. So I don't know. This is just yeah. an idea. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting too, the, the, just the image of a circle of, of sovereignty rights, at least sovereignty, um, we'll see the, the issue of the loss of statehood um, is being taken up by the ILA and also the ILC. But there are more questions than answers, and I think this is really bringing that out. And your, your talk about landlocked states is, um, a, uh, there's a question on that from Ankit. And Ankit, did you want to ask that live? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for your speech and the talk you gave. It's not not every day do you get an opportunity to, to see a drawing by uh, an ambassador. So very, very thoughtful of you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, my questions, I in fact had two questions. One first was on um, the point that you made that there's no solid policy adopted by the, as a state response. So what is the reason for that? Why is it that, I mean, to my mind, it seems like a far cry that if there's if the countries that are directly affected by this don't take the mantle of change, then change seems rather unlikely proposition. So why is it that you said that there is no solid policy which is coming out? And my second question is, uh, you said that there are rights given to the landlocked states, but I mean, if you look at states, landlocked states like Ethiopia, for instance, and a lot of other states also, they're economically not, not very well off. So don't you feel that the convention should give more rights and more uh, freedoms to these uh, landlocked countries in order for them to improve their economic situation? Those are my two questions. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Um, on the landlord states, uh, I believe uh, the convention has already provided the basis. And um, I think you have it uh, in Nepal, probably, yeah? uh, Bhutan. Uh, I think the issue is how you work with the transit states. So because then you have the landlocked state, you have the ocean, and in between you have transit states. So arrangements uh, with them would be something uh, that is very important uh, to have access uh, to the ocean. So this is one 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 way to do that. Uh, I would I would imagine that uh, you know we cannot give more rights than that. Uh, this is a is a is a fact that uh, they have discussed this very thoroughly uh, during the negotiation. So. We have almost the same um, arrangement, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. So if you look at the map uh, in between the Malaysian uh, territory in the peninsula and the Malaysian territory in Sarawak and Borneo, in between you have Indonesian islands there, okay? So in the old days before the UNCLOS, um, they, they have a free transit from, from um, peninsula to Sarawak, and um, now they have go through Indonesian waters, through archipelagic waters. They have go through uh, Indonesian sovereignty. So UNCLOS provides a basis for us to create uh, an arrangement, an agreement. So we signed an agreement with Malaysia in 1982 on the laying of cables, on the fishery issue, on the um, transits, on the transportation. So we allow a Malaysian fishermen to fish in our waters. Uh, we allow Malaysia to lay cables and, and, and communication cable, electric cables, um, different types of uh, communications uh, it's, it's, it's allowed. So I think the key is in the um, uh, agreement with the transit state in your case. And in our case, it's almost the same, but a different structure. Uh, uh, arrangement uh, bilaterally. Now, um, no solid policy. Uh, I've spoken with different uh, colleagues in different countries informally, uh, in different uh, multilateral settings, and uh, they are, I would say, they're very wary. You know, they they sign the conventions. The convention says that you have to calculate everything from baseline. But they have their own interest. If they calculate everything on the baseline, then they will have no more seas. So uh, they are actually in dilemma. Um, that's why the decisions to make a fixing of baseline only came in the mid uh, in the, in 2015, only just five years ago. This they have discussed a long time ago. Uh, they have some internal papers uh, among the Pacific countries already. At the end of 1990s, when they start to see the rising of sea level, but they just don't know what exactly to do because the law, international law, says that you can't do that. The principle is land dominates sea. The principle is that you have to have the land, you have the ocean, then you have the low water line, and then you have to calculate from there, and then there you have the EZ. Otherwise, you cannot have that. And um, I think with the pressing of time, with the continuous problem that they see, they are think quite desperate, I would say. So they have those policies among themselves. Others, like us, for instance, we don't have yet. We are still working on that. Uh, I would say other countries the same. Uh, but the Pacific, as Nilu mentioned, this are uh, directly impacted. Uh, then they, they, I think they are forced to do that. So it's a very unfortunate situation that but international law normally are slow um, in many different issues. Uh, illegal fishing, for instance. Um, you see, uh, Ankit, SDG mentioned, SDG 14 mentioned, this year we have to abolish uh, fishery subsidies. And that is WTO. And WTO, as of today, could not even manage a discussion on fishery subsidies. So, and fishery subsidy is a one big chunk in illegal fishing across the world. Uh, you know, so international law is very slow. And um, unfortunately, bad guys know that. <laughs> so in, in, in other situations, uh, uh, like the rising of sea level, it creates a very unfortunate dilemma uh, for those countries. So I think that's why they came up with a state practice just recently, just five years ago, if 15, 18, 
uh, you know, to 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 drum up international support. Thank you, Agit. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big challenge for international law. Um, I have uh, one, I believe it's a question, I have not a comment, so that will be the last one. And then I know Professor Beckman would like to also make a comment. So there's a comment or question from Genevieve, um, and it has, and it is um, imp important actually, it's an issue. One aspect should surely be on whether maritime charts should be a snapshot and fixed for all time or updated for mariner safety of navigation. So this is an issue that has discussed the role of charts um, and then particularly how, how it is in the, under, in the convention. So any comments on that, Ambassador? And then I'm going to let um, Professor yeah. Beckman make. Yes, yeah, we have chart is, uh... Chart is very important for navigations, of course, and chart is very important for us uh, in terms of the issue of rising sea level, especially in the coastal development, because if you want to bet, develop um, anything on the coastal area, whether it's uh, tourism, marine tourism, whether it's port, you need a chart, okay? And uh, the chart will tell you how is the depth of the water, how is the behavior of the oceans and all different aspects of that. Now, if you use charts as we are doing today as a basis then to develop our baseline, then chart has to reflect the reality. You know, you, <laughs> a chart that does not reflect reality, then uh, it might create a danger in navigations, for instance, right? Uh, it might create other different hosts of issue. For instance, if you have uh, area where there are mangroves or there are already seagrasses or corals underneath that, and then your chart does not say that, uh, then uh, it will create the environment. Or if you have, like for Indonesia, for instance, we have 182 spots of the Second World War mines. Still exists, still not yet cleared. The chart has to say that, right? It has to reflect the fact that there are bombs in different parts of Indonesian water still alive. And um, you have to reflect that. Now, if you reflect that chart, uh, then we cannot fix the baseline. So this is, <laughs> this is the dilemma because then you have to apply the convention as it is. And the, the convention requires the the the. The, the, the question does not say about the latest updated chart. So you can use the British charts uh, in the 1800s for this purpose, but uh, for other purposes, you have different charts. But then, you know, let's not be very honest uh, in this uh, international uh, openness of uh, sea connection. So again, uh, I think uh, this is one of the uh, session in the, the, the academy that creates more more questions than <laughs> than answer because it's a problem for for all of us to to think through what would be you know uh, the best way to address this particular aspect. Nilo. Yeah, and that's right. Well, that's part of what we're here to do is to raise these issues and promote some thinking um, on this. I apologize, um, uh, Bob. There was apparently one question I missed. Do you want to make your comment, and then I can take that last question? I will take the question. Take question. Okay. I apologize, uh, Nisri. Um, the question is, thank you, Ambassador. Will the exclusive economic, economic zone be extended if land is reclaimed from the sea, such as the Palm in Dubai and the Port City Construct in Sri Lanka? And this is from Nisri from Sri Lanka, actually. So, so this will be the last question. Well, um, there are certain uh, rules uh, in terms of uh, man-made baselines, okay? Um, there are some articles that you have to follow in the conventions, whether it's uh, parts of the ports, for instance, or whether it's allowed for a man-made uh, to become as a base point for you to extend your maritime zone. But I think uh, in general, in terms of approach, uh, countries need to be very, very uh, careful and very strict on this particular uh, issue. I'll give you a real life example, uh, not, uh, not an hypothetical example. It's the uh, reclamations that Singapore has uh, when we are negotiating, okay? 
So um, we had a long discussion with our uh, counterpart and we come to a conclusion that uh, we are using the uh, old uh, Singapore small islands that uh, Singapore has in the old chart as a basis for us to uh, measure our baseline. So we basically disregard the uh, reclamations that uh, Singapore has done in the western part of uh, Singapore and also in the eastern part of Singapore. So thus we have a very balanced interest of both countries being taken care of, um, but it's basically a political uh, exercise, but it's a political exercise within Indonesia and Singapore that uh, follows the rules of international law of the sea. So we did not use uh, the end of the uh, Singapore reclamation. We used uh, different features uh, and uh, that is acceptable for both parties. So I would say uh, reclamations, um, you know, it's, it has to be very careful in looking at reclamations as a basis to extend your, uh, not only EEZ, it means you extend your territorial sea, contiguous zone, EEZ, and, and so on and so forth. Yes, Thank you. you. Professor Beckman, the floor is yours. You need to unmute. You need to unmute. Okay, sorry, three quick points. One, in terms of freezing baselines or freezing outer limits, I think there would be a lot more resistance to allowing a state to extend its territorial sea beyond 12 miles. If you end up with a 20 or 30 mile territorial sea, that is gonna be a problem. On the other hand, if you extend in effect your economic zone for a few miles, you'll get 200 already. There may not be as much objection. In terms of, I agree that it'd almost be impossible to amend uh, the law of the sea convention but I'm not sure the ILC has looked at the prospect of a general assembly declaration. When I used to teach international law, I would argue there's a handful of declarations like that on friendly relations, peaceful uses of outer space, which are adopted without any negative votes, if not unanimously. And no state at the, when it's adopted expresses a contrary interest then one could argue this is either the best evidence of custom or it's a, it's a consensus on how the treaty should be interpreted. The final comment, if you like me, I'd like to share a screen to show what sometimes happens. Can you see that? Can, any, can you see the screen that I put up? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, this yes, is this is well. the uh, this is the Japanese island of Okini Torashima, yeah, 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 from which they claim not only a territorial sea and an economic zone, but an outer continental shelf. And the little circle in the middle uh, is there to ensure that that very tiny rock in the middle never goes below water at high tide. Now, therefore, this shows how the wealthy countries could perhaps attempt to spend uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to ensure that their other island uh, is a naturally formed area that continues to be above water at high tide. Uh, there's a second slide I have, which is a little more extreme, and this is a facility built by, I believe, the Republic of Korea on a low tide elevation in an area that is either the economic zone of China or the economic zone of South Korea. I don't want to take a position on that, but it's probably another extreme example of how a harbor works could be created and states could continue to claim their economic zones from that. So I'll stop there. I found it a very interesting presentation and very thought provoking. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Bob, and uh, for your added comments. I think which enrich this discussion. There's a lot. There's a lot to say in the whole issue of um, building adaptation through artificial and natural means, 
artificial islands. We know that the Maldives is building um, an artificial capital, Hum Humale. Mm -hmm. um, so these are lots of issues that we can go on and talk about. But I think, um, Ambassador, you gave us an excellent uh, overview, and not just an overview, you introduced new ideas to us. Um, and as you said, we're asking more questions than answering them, but then this is an, an area that wasn't thought about when the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated. And I have to say, I also appreciate your highlighting the preamble because we do have to keep that into account when we're looking to how to interpret uh, the convention. So I think I can uh, express uh, on behalf of the Academy and the participants our deepest gratitude for your taking the time and being with us and sharing the rich experience and knowledge you have. And I offer an applause. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. we're not in a room together. <laughs> Next time, I hope. Next time, I hope. So okay. thank you very much. And Zue, I think you have some uh, final uh, housekeeping matters to, to tell us. Yes, thank you, Nilifer. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for that amazing lecture. Um, for everyone who's uh, watching, listening in, this is, uh, first of all, a reminder that the guest lecture next week will not be at this timing. It will be at 9 p.m. Singapore timing. Uh, but the if you're not able to make that time, the recordings will, as usual, be available. Uh, for those of you watching us on the Facebook live stream, uh, please stay tuned for lectures next week and subsequently recordings are also available on the CIL website for participants of the E-Academy. See you tomorrow in class. Thank you everyone very much. Goodbye. <laughs>